Ah, I'm sorry, you guys. I don't know why that. Let me try this again. Okay, present. Oh, I won't have a winner. I'm sorry, we won't have a winner today. That's what I was missing. Um, so my name is Carrie Carlson, and I am going to kick us off today. Um, but before I get started into all the, the good stuff that you all need to know, um, we are going to use Mentimeter today. Um, and if so, if you all would, I know that you got some pre-instructions. But you can join from your phone, your tablet. Um, I have actually joined from my TV before. So anything that has access, um, at the top of this um, slide, it says instructions. So if you go to www.menti, that's M-E-N-T-I dot com, and then you'll be prompted to enter a code. And that code is 5902. 6234. Or you can use a QR code that is on the right hand side of the screen also. And yeah, I see people reacting awesome. If you guys will just let me know that you're in there, I will move to the next slide. Yay, we got lots of reactions. And if you see at the bottom of the screen, there are reactions. We've got a heart question mark, thumbs up, thumbs down, a cat. That cat could mean so many different things, right? Some people might like them, some people might not. Um, I have two that you might see or hear, right? Um, and then there's a little uh, word bubble, right? Any, all of these slides are enabled so that you guys can interact throughout this whole presentation with us. Um, I see lots of reactions. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. Um, there we go. Okay. And also, so on this slide, we want to know who has used Mentimeter. So on the top of this, it says, have you ever used Mentimeter? Oh, yes. And um, the options are yes. And we have got a um, man with a black and white running suit on doing the running man. Um, one of my favorite, and it says, oh, yes. And then we've got a cute little kitty shaking its head no um, for no, you've never used it. Um, and then I'm so confused. And that is, I think it's a worm. Um, he's shaking his head with a, a disturbed look on his face. And it says, I'm so confused. Or I have no, and that is for, I have no clue. So if you have never used Mentimeter before, I'm starting my timer so I don't take too long. Um, then go to that www.menti.com and put in that code. And, and on every one of these slides, let me move that. I don't know if that's in y'all's way or not. Um, you will see the code for the um, Mentimeter. It is 59026234, I'm sorry. Um, and you can use the reactions. You can follow along with this presentation. And if you're still confused, we can absolutely answer some questions for you all. Does anybody have any questions yet on how to use this? I wanna make sure the person that's confused is not yet anymore. <clears throat> Okay, well, let me know if you have any questions, okay? Um, so I want to introduce myself to you all. So my name is Carrie Carlson. I'm an advocate with the Tennessee Disability Coalition. Um, and we are going to create a space for you all today where we can learn about disability and um, we can share all this information with you. Please ask questions. You can use the the reactions. Um, but please also let us know if you have any access needs, right? As a side slide says, you are important and we can adapt, right? We can um, pretty much adapt to a lot of different things. So if you can't hear me, if I'm going too fast, I am from up north. So sometimes I can talk a little faster than I should. Um, so just let us know if you guys have any access needs. Um, and on this slide, 
It is a beautiful purple background and the words say, um, please let us know if you have any access needs um, because you matter and we can adapt. And those letters are in white. And as you can tell, I am describing these slides today and we like to use universal design in our presentations. So we're going to describe these slides um, and also, I have not described myself yet, and each one of us will do this. Uh, I am a middle-aged white woman with, uh, looks like brown hair in this picture today, and I am standing in front of a uh, blue wall, and I have a white door back there, and if you guys can see, I've got uh, some art hanging in my office as well. Um, behind me is a... Um, rainbow um, art display and that has the Memphis Bridge on it uh, and then you can't really see the other pieces but there's two really pretty um, images of or pieces of art from local Memphis artists so um, that is me um, and each one of us will do that for you all um, and on this slide it is a really beautiful blue background we have the Tennessee Disability Coalition logo on the top here in white and it says the Tennessee Disability Coalition is an alliance of organizations and individuals joined to promote the full and equal participation of people with disabilities in all aspects of life, right? And that's what we're going to talk to you all about today, how you can make sure that um, you are including people with disabilities as much as you can, right? As much as possible. Um, so. And we have our agenda for today. Um, and on this slide, again, the QR code. If anybody is just joining us um, to use to get into um, Mentimeter, you can use the QR code that is located on the bottom left hand of your screen, or you can go to www.menti.com. That's M-E-N-T-I.com, and enter that five nine zero two. 6234, right? Um, and you can follow along, right? You can go for a walk and follow along with us today if you'd like. But there's a Polaroid in the middle of this, right? A white outline with black in the middle. And the um, letters in here say today's agenda, right? My, um, I am going to talk to you about Disability 101. That is the first bullet and what you can do. Um, and then Sarah, is going to talk to you about art and disability um, and what can you do. And then Hannah is going to talk to you all about accessibility and what you can do. Um, and then in the bottom right hand corner is the image from the, the flyer for this. It says reframing disability with a yellow background. Um, it's got red um, letters. Give you a little, little um, explanation myself. I can't see the red letters, but I know that it says May 19th on it. Um, and it's got different colored frames, right? Um, and, and various sizes on the bottom. Any questions so far? No? Okay. Um, so, um, do any of you have any expectations for today? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and this is one of those slides where you can type in whatever you would like on here um, and let me know if you, let us know, sorry, if you guys have any expectations for today. So I'm going to give it just, ooh, and this is a word cloud. So the more that people say the, the, the word or the phrase, the bigger it's going to get, okay? Um, <sighs> So tips and tools, we have that one. Anyone else? Oh, they're coming in fast. Okay, tip seat. Uh, um, new ex access ideas, tips, uh, greater awareness, yes. Barriers. Information, All right, resources, that's getting bigger. Um, best practices. All right. Resources got bigger. Best practices. All right. So you guys have this. That's awesome. 
greater awareness. Okay. And you guys can access this two days after today. So through Sunday, you guys can access this presentation and you can add to it. You can see responses. Um, all right. So we, I think looking at these and um, my colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong. I think we're going to achieve all of this for you all today. Um, so let's keep going. And when I say the word disability, what is the first thing that comes to your mind, right? Um, and, and there's no wrong answer to this. As the, my slide says, right, um, nobody's going to um, get in, you know, there's no, um, there's no right answer for any of these today. So when I say disability, what comes to your mind? All right, challenges, underserved, unseen, barriers, various needs. All right, physical or mental, yes. Accommodations, yeah. All right, so we have, oh, these are really good. Differences, difference. Um, I'm, I'm reading all these. So health, we've got identity, yeah, exclusion. Okay, so I'm going to keep going just because time, right? I could sit here and watch you guys put these in all day. But um, yeah, uh, and you know, challenges was the number one answer on there, trait. So these are all really great answers. Um, and so on this slide, on the, on the left-hand side, it says disability is not a dirty word, right? And disability and dirty word are in really um, a pretty greenish, bluish um, text that might look a little different for you all also. And um, is not A as in pink, um, kind of script writing. So disability. So the ADA definition of a disability, and I'm going to go into the ADA in a little bit. It's a, it's a disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major activity, right? And, or life activity, I'm sorry. So our disability, it can be and, and is, right, part of our identity, right? It is our culture. Um, it is expansive, right? Just because I have um, a eye condition does not mean that somebody from the that has the same thing as me is going to require or need the same thing. Um, and it changes over time. Um, it is diverse. Um, I just hit on that a little bit, but um, that is the ADA definition of disability here. Uh, and then here's some things you guys said unseen a couple times, right? Um, and here on this slide, we've got um, eight blue circles uh, on a white background. And there are different um, images. Uh, and I'm going to describe each one of these. Um, and disabilities that sometimes are not seen as a disability, right? So on this top um, left one, we have a glass of some golden beverage, right? I'm going to assume with the fuzz in the glass that it's it's beer, right? Maybe symbolizing alcoholism, right? Some people don't see alcoholism as a disability. Or the next one is an outline of a person with what appears to be sweat drops um, for hyperhidrosis, right? That is an excessive sweating disorder that, that really can limit people's ability to to go out in public or, or do things because they might be unconscious or self-conscious about it. Um, and then in the next one, we've got a pink ribbon and that does pink, maybe breast cancer, right? Um, any kind of cancer, um, any kinds of complex health need. Um, the next one is a syringe. I'm in a vial of something and, and I put in my description, right, for, for um, diabetes, but that could be anything else that requires that level of monitoring and medication. Um, and then there's a shrimp down here in the bottom left-hand um, circle. 
And that could be shellfish, right? I know people have severe allergies to foods. My daughter's school, one of her classmates is allergic to bananas, right? And, and it, it's, it's a big problem during lunch. Um, and then there's a red hand in the next one with a white ribbon, and that is for HIV or AIDS. Um, and, and then there is a bed in the next uh, circle. And that could be somebody who has a, maybe an aging person, right? That is now um, unable to, to get around as much or um, somebody who um, has, has broken a bone recently who can't move around, right? Disability isn't always something that, that you live with for your whole life, right? Sometimes it's something that, that is, um, that is um, just in the now. Um, and then there's a brain in the next one. And uh, uh, one of my other um, responsibilities and, and jobs at the TDC is um, to work with the brain injury um, organization, Brain Links. And I spend a lot of time talking about cognitive disabilities, um, whether that is somebody aging who, who might um, be experiencing that or somebody who's had a concussion or, or traumatic brain injury. Um, so, so many different things, um, but just, you guys said it, but you know, things that sometimes people don't think as of, of being a disability um, or it's not recognized. Any questions, comments No. Okay, I saw the little thing go. Um, so the ADA, right? I kind of have thrown that word around a couple of times now, I think. Um, so that is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And on the left-hand side of the screen, sorry about the noise out of my window open, it's nice in, in Memphis. Um, we have four boxes and those um, blue boxes have different images in them. And the first one is, is white hands and that um, is, is representing American Sign Language um, and having access to that. Um, the next one is an outline of an ear with a line through it, right? It could be somebody who is deaf or hard of hearing. Um, and in the bottom left-hand corner is the, the universal symbol for wheelchair, right? Um, and then the next one is a image of a person standing with what appears to be a white cane, right? And that could be somebody with, with some, some vision problems. Um, and the American Disability Act, right? That was signed into law in 1990. And this is only 32 years ago, but it's almost, it's basically 33 years ago. Um, and that is a civil rights law. And it is to make sure that people are not discriminated against because of their disability and that people can have equal access to participation um, in public uh, and, and private spaces, right? And federal, federal things um, like voting or going to, um, uh, I know that, that stadiums now are, are getting better, but you know, going to a stadium and having, being able to experience that and that being accessible. So that is the ADA. Um, and, Sometimes I ask, you know, what were you doing in 1990? But not everybody, you know, we've got some young people on this call, I'm sure. So maybe they weren't even um, alive for 1990. So I've got two images here just to kind of put this into perspective for some of us. Pretty Woman came out. That was a number one hit movie in when the ADA was passed. If you have never seen Pretty Woman, you like, I'm sorry. Um, it's great. Um, and then Pump Up the Jam. And if you've never heard Pump Up the Jam, you guys have to just Google it. And at, right after this call, like it's kind of like you have to. Um, so in, in both of these images, right? So um, on the first one, there's a man with a black suit standing up against a woman. And mm, she's got some really high boots on and a really, a really short mini skirt. Um, and it says pretty woman um, in red letters, or I guess that's pink on the right hand side. Um, and then pump up the gym. I always forget her name. I'm sorry. Um, but it is a very pretty, I think that she's a black lady um, in, the, in the center and she's got her arms crossed. Um, and 
Technotronics is the name of it. I forgot about that. Um, is, is in letters, but this is July of 1990. So just to give us a little, little perspective on where that was, where we were at during that time. Can it, does anybody want to share like something from July of 1990? Don't want to out anybody, but you know, it's okay. We'll keep going. Um, no. Okay. I thought somebody was putting something in there. Um, and the ADA. So there are many different titles of the ADA. And in this um, slide, there are um, five titles um, in different colors. The, the one on the top says Title I in a circle with a line that says Equal Employment Opportunities. Um, Title II is in green, a, a green circle, and it says Non-Discrimination in State and Local Government Services. Um, and Title Three is the next one, and that's where we're going to kind of stay focused today. Um, and that says non-discrimination by public accommodations in commercial facilities, right? And Hannah is going to really go into that with you all. Title Four is telecommunications, and that is in um, orange, I believe that is. Um, and then Title Five is in black, and that's miscellaneous. Just wanted to give you an overview of each one of those titles. You guys can always go to um, the ADA website and, and get all you all you can ask for in terms of ADA compliance and, and what each one of these titles break down into. But I'm going to um, kind of throw some, some quotes at you guys now. Um, I'm sorry, you guys don't see that. So disability isn't static. It evolves both physically and mentally, right? And that's Ellen. I always say her last name wrong, so I'm not going to embarrass myself today. Um, but you know, some of these are, are kinds of kind of deep, and and you can kind of kind of think about that a little bit, right? But it's not. It's not static, and it evolves. Um, I know that um, that you know we are all evolving in every aspect of our life, but. Um, but also people with disabilities, um, sometimes their disability evolves faster or slower, depending on, you know, how that is for them. Um, yeah, it happens to everyone eventually. Yes, absolutely, it does. Um, and um, disability, a state of being, a natural part of the human experience, right? Goes back to that comment just a second ago, right? Thank you for um, that comment. Cause yeah, that's what I was gonna say, right? If you are somebody who has not experienced disability yet, um, you know, it, it is a part of aging and, and life. Um, and, uh, and, and disability can happen at, at any time in somebody's life, right? Um, it is not just something that, that people are born with or that happens as an aging person. Um, working in, in brain injury and with the Tennessee Disability Coalition, right, we, we, we um, hear about people experiencing it when they're not expecting it. Um, but disability is, holistic, is a holistic experience, so it needs to have holistic definition, right? A disability is not just a physical um, diagnosis, but a lived experience in which um, parameters and barriers are placed upon our lived, upon our lives, sorry, because of the diagnosis. Um, and that's really important for people to remember. Um, that's, and I'm gonna go into some, some ableism here in a second, but you know, um, it, it's part of our, our lived experience. Um, especially if you are a person with a disability or you know somebody with a disability. Um, and ableism, right, as promised. So ableism, it is a set of beliefs or practices um, that devalue and discriminate against people with physical, intellectual, or psychiatric disabilities. Um, and often, um, rest on the assumption that disabled people need to be fixed in one form or another, right? And I'm gonna go through some phrases in a second, but this image on the right-hand side, I absolutely love it. It's from an, an ableism website and it has got really beautiful, vibrant colors. And uh, I couldn't fit the whole thing on here because uh, Mentimeter is, is an accessible platform. 
um, and it won't allow you to, to have too big of an image, right? But this is some barriers that um, you know people face in terms of ableism. There is a hand there. There is um, what I feel is a, a pole obstructing somebody's access to that sidewalk. Um, but just different different things that that could um, be a barrier of some kind for somebody. Um, but um, what does ableism look like, right? So the eugenics movement, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that, but you know, that was a movement in the early 1900s where people were sterilized if they had a disability. Um, lack of accommodations or lack of compliance with the ADA, I'm sorry. You know, not because um, some, I, I've heard people, you know, say that it wasn't necessary, right? Um, segregation, segregating people with disabilities. We still see this happen um, in, in various places and um, our schools sometimes can be a, a good example of this, right? Um, and using disability as a punchline or mocking people with disabilities. And again, sadly, you know, we, we still see this and, and hear about this often. And, and sometimes, especially I have a very young daughter, it's just about teaching them um, and, and, and really educating them on, on why this is not okay to do, right? Because um, kids are generally sweet, loving individuals. So setting those, those, um, those uh, standards early and, and making sure they understand. Um, and everyday or minor, minor ableism. So choosing an inaccessible venue or meeting. Hannah's gonna go over that with you guys, so I'm not gonna talk about that right now. But framing disability is either tragic or inspirational, right? There's a there's a um, saying inspiration porn, right? Um, or using an accessible bathroom or parking space. This one, oh, this one. I could talk all day about this one. But um, you know, even um, using those accessible bathrooms. Uh, I've, I was in a restroom the other day and, and uh, two young girls came out of the accessible stall and there had been a lady waiting for a very long time that actually needed that stall. So things like that, we need to think about those things. And questioning if someone is actually disabled or how much, how disabled they are. I get this one all the time. You should see people's face when I, cause I have macular degeneration. When I drive up to somewhere, people are like, oh my gosh, she drives, right? Or, right, you, uh, I, I say that and, and um, people think that like I'm, I'm lying or using that as an excuse, right? But make sure that we're not doing that or ask it or, you know, questioning somebody's disability. Uh, and then on this, there is a big circle with a big black R in the middle. Um, the circle is red with a line across it, um, like, you know, don't use that. And there's white letters that say ban the R word, www.the-t-h-e-r and word, w-o-r-t, w-o-r-d dot org, sorry. Um, and it says watch your mouth, right? <clears throat> I hear this all the time. You know, you're so OCD. I have OCD um, and being organized is not having OCD, right? That is just being organized. Um, or people throw ADHD around a lot, right? Because they have lots of energy. A lot of people have lots of energy, but that is really, um, really affects that diagnosis for some people, right? And it's not taken seriously when those words are thrown around like that sometimes. Um, and that guy is so crazy, right? And this is also reckoning our own, um, our own, I don't, I don't know, I can't find my word today, but, but recognizing, um, our own biases and, and words that we use. I have to stop myself a lot saying crazy, right? He's not, oh yes, he is in here. We have a puppy. And and when when my when we got him, my daughter was calling him baby psycho. And I had again, right, had to explain, like, we can't do that. 
But, um, you know, using those words is hard. I'm not going to say that some of this stuff isn't hard, but we just have to get into the practice of, of um, thinking about these things and not using them. And um, I can pray for you or can I pray for you? I've, I've had this one a lot, right? And again, these depend on the person, right? Um, part of part of this whole thing is right asking that person with a disability they might want you to pray for them right so again ask that person about that um, and I don't ever think of you being disabled um, that's another one or I had a friend reach out to me she was not doing it maliciously she asked me if I had a a um, one of those uh um, uh, oh my gosh, I can't think of a, uh, things that make things bigger. What is that thing called? You guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, and ask me if I had one that she could borrow for her son's, um, Halloween costume, right? She meant nothing by it, but again, right. You gotta think about that kind of stuff. Don't ever ask somebody, you know, can I borrow your cane for my kids? Um, Halloween costume. That's just, you know, she, she was very upset when I, you know, explained it to her, but you know, things like that. So just, just watching what we're saying and doing and, and thinking about people first. Um, and what can you do? Um, just give it a couple seconds. This is another one of those, put this in the, uh, this is a, uh, this is a, um, word cloud again, I believe can't remember, but your answers will pop up there. But what can you do to make sure that you are, are kind of following best practices for not, um, you know, saying the wrong thing or um, making sure that you're being compliant? And again, Hannah's going to go over that. So um, really, really deeply. Um, this. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys, I have to, no, this isn't, oh. I don't know why it's not coming up in here. Oh, there we go. Okay, be thoughtful about language, yes. Be more aware, spread awareness. Think about the words I use, yeah. Be mindful, change language. Think before speaking, ask questions, definitely. Okay, well, in the aspect of time, because I did that right on time, I am going to hand this over to Sarah and I'm going to have to minimize my screen here. Um, I'm going to go to the next one. I, I don't think I know I can't. Okay. So I'm going to minimize this. We'll come back to this. I had it up. Thank you, Carrie. Oh, so, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, Carrie is fantastic. I'm honored to work with her at the Tennessee Disability Coalition. She's pulling up a, a video for me that we're going to start my section with. Hi, my name is Sarah. I work with the Tennessee Disability Coalition. I am a middle-aged white woman with reddish brown hair wearing a flowered shirt. I'm sitting in my office. There's light coming in from behind me. I have an image on the wall from uh, my alma mater and a uh, uh, barely surviving plant in my window. I'm really excited to be here this morning. I might also speak quickly. So if I start to, or if you need anything at all from me, hop into the comments section and let me know what you need. Uh, so to get started, we're going to share this video. It is called Elevators. It is by Tanara Kalem and Tony Brooks as a part of a virtual performance project called Punchlight, which highlights the work of artists with disabilities. Carrie, if you'll play that for us. Yeah. 
Hello. Hi. Yes. Hello. We haven't met before. Met before. Yes. I am. I am. My name is. My name is. Oh, no, you go. No, you. My name is I'm trying. Oh, my name is. Can't get the services. Can't get food on appointment. Can't go see my dying grandmother. I always like that you smile at me, but I can't tell. If it's pity or friendliness, I know. The elevator broken, so I can't. We all can't. But no, especially I can't. My name is lived here for six years and never asked you your name. My name is lived here for six years and you never told me your name. I find you delightful, but I hope that's not pity. Are you doing okay? What what are you doing to find you joy? I wonder when will the elevator be moving again? What can I do? Can I do something? I am sore. I'm Tanara. Thank you, Carrie. So Carrie's gonna move us back to our Mentimeter presentation. In the meantime, will you please think about if you have a response to that video? Because that's the question that I'm gonna ask you to put into Mentimeter, what your response is to that, that performance. I'll give you just a minute. Um, I'll also give a little bit of background. Um, Punchlight is named because a punch light is used to flood an area with high intensity light. And this project, a part of their purpose is to open preconceived ideas about how art is made, who gets to make it, and who has access to it. Um, it's also pretty cool because they're intentional about universal access, right? They have the audio description, they have captioning, they have the ASL interpretation, and they intentionally put those accommodations to the foreground as a reminder that access is a foundation for just and equitable society. Well, thank you for the response. Meaning meaningful and genuine. I have to say, I found it thought provoking. And, um, and a, a colleague of mine who, who saw it, a colleague of mine who viewed it said she had to watch it a couple times before she knew what her response was. Um, so Carrie, you can go to the next slide. Question, if you can put your thoughts in Mentimeter, we'll also talk about it here for a minute. How does Elevator's performance address ableism? Quick reminder from Carrie's section, ableism is a set of beliefs or practices that devalue and discriminate against people with disabilities. Any thoughts? And thank you, we had a comment in the chat, be the change you speak of, non-disabled will understand what we sometimes don't understand. Someone put in to Mentimeter privilege. Elevators addresses ableism through privilege. Yeah. I also really like that it just puts out front our our relationships between disabled and non-disabled folks, you know, and both of them thinking internally about whether their what their intentions are, right? Am I being friendly or am I being pitying? And either way, realizing that they failed to introduce themselves as people to one another, right? They've uh, haven't given each other their names yet. Yes, thank you. Elevators emphasizes discomfort with disability. Yeah. 
Uh, the title elevators hits hard because the there are parts of our building that aren't accessible, right? So it's this, the, the title of the piece is this physical representation of a barrier to access and a, a barrier between people with and without disabilities. Thank you. Uh, the next, the a comment was put into the chat. Names are so central. You beat me to the names thought. Sorry, John, but thanks to Echo, what I was thinking there. Thank you. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Thanks, Carrie. Um, anybody take anything new away from this art piece? It's okay if not, or okay if you need some more time to process it. All right, well, I encourage you to check out Punchlight. It is affiliated with Temple University, and they have a couple other thought-provoking art pieces as well. Let me go to the next slide. So we can all name a famous artist with a disability. On this screen, there's a portrait of five artists, Frida Kahlo, Beethoven, Ray Charles, Chuck Close, Pablo Picasso, and Judith Scott. Uh, but when we think of them, we think of them as artists first, and then a person with a disability, whether or not that's how they thought of themselves or represented themselves in their work. The point is that disability cannot only be invisible, but many of us may not choose to represent our disability in our artwork or in our professional persona as an artist, or we may feel unsafe in doing so. So just a comment that I guarantee there are more artists in your orbits who experience disability than you may be aware of because of that. So next, we're going to go behind the scenes for a moment and pull back the, cur the curtain to look at how some artists make their art. Um, disability is often associated with inability. And so we're assumed that we can't, can't make art because we present in a way that that society believes we can't do things for ourselves. Um, so just to take a look, I'm going to show you some images of a couple cool ways people with disabilities make artwork. You can go ahead and carry. Uh, this is Daraj Sadavilkar. He is a man of Indian descent who is sitting and sculpting using his feet. Um, he does not, he has uh, different arms, and so he's making figures in sculpture. You can go to the next slide. Paul Smith is an older white man posed in this image next to his typewriter. Um, he creates art using one finger on a typewriter, and there's also an uh, image on the screen of his work a replica of the Mona Lisa, and then a close-up of that piece. The next image, Shaitan Tennant is a young white man who uses a prosthetic limb in his work as a tattoo artist. There's an image of him with his prosthetic limb, and then there's two images, one of a cartoon woman who he has uh, produced on someone's body, and an anatomical art that heart that he has produced on someone's body. The next image. John Bramblett is a young white man wearing sunglasses, featured painting using texture on canvas. He's blind and yet creates artwork that's brightly colored in two portraits, one of a man and one of a woman are featured here. Next slide, Huang Gofo is a man of Asian heritage who does not have arms. He is in this image painting using a paintbrush in his mouth. He's painting an elaborate scene of a village on stilts on a giant canvas. This is an image of two middle-aged white women. One, Susan Brown, identifies as deafblind and is, is holding a cane. They are wrapping a tree outside with art that was knitted by Susan. This is actually a part of a bigger initiative I think you might be interested in. It's called Yarn Bombing or Knit Feedy. And Deafblind International has done a very good job organizing and inspiring their community to yarn bomb because it helps raise awareness that there are deaf blind people in every community and they can contribute even to community art. And then finally, this is Tommy Hollenstein. He is a young white man in a power wheelchair and he paints using the wheels of his chair. So the image on top is of him painting. He is seated and he's using colorful um, 
every color to paint on a giant canvas underneath him. And then there's two images of his artwork. One has reddish and purplish and greenish, and one is on a black background with neon tracks. So we just peeked into the private lives of a handful of artists with disabilities to see how they create their art. But we're gonna zoom out again for a minute to think about how we interact with people with disabilities as whole people. Right, so we think about famous artists, we think about them as an artist first, but they're many layered. Um, whether they're you know, famous or not, artists is just one part of their identity. Uh, our identities are complex and we get to choose how we show up in a space. So yes, next slide. This is an image you may have seen before. It's a diagram of the concept of intersectionality. And it is defined below by Kimberly Crenshaw Intersectionality is a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides, where it in locks and intersects. It is the acknowledgement that everyone has their own unique experiences of discrimination and privilege. And on the right of her diagram, you see different concepts of identity that overlap race, ethnicity, gender identity, class, language, religion, ability, sexuality, mental health, age, education, body size, and many more. Next slide, please. So in the world, when you think about engaging people with disabilities, be it online or on, in person, let us define ourselves to you. Follow ADA guidelines like Carrie mentioned and like Hannah will talk about more. Presume competence, just presume we, we have the ability before proving otherwise or asking for an accommodation. Ask us what we need to fully participate. As Carrie mentioned, disability is diverse and it's gonna be a different experience for everyone. Someone just added to the, track, the chat, uh, people mistreat people they don't understand because of disability. That's right. Um, another way to think about engaging with people with disabilities is prepare using universal design and inclusiveness concepts, which I'm gonna talk about next. Carla just added to the text, we're all stigmatized by the dated universal symbol of disability. So Carla put into the chat the image of disability as a person using a wheelchair. And yes, there is controversy around that in the diverse disability community because it only represents one type of mobility aid, not the whole world of disability. So next we're gonna think about preparing universal design concepts for how folks will engage with your content, with your art, with your event, using their senses. So the diagram on the screen has the, an image of the five senses are, are surrounding an image of a brain, sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. We're gonna talk about quickly. So first let's talk about sight. The image on the screen is a diagram of average viewing sight lines for folks. Uh, one is a person standing. And so her eye level looking at uh, something on the wall is going to be much higher than the person sitting in a wheelchair next to her. So just to bring to attention that average viewing sight lines are different. Eye level is different for someone using a chair or at a different height. Other things to think about when we think about preparing our spaces and our content and how folks will engage with them based on site. If there's gonna be bright or flashing lights in your content or your space, it's a good idea to give folks a heads up in case that might be challenging to their vision or it might cause problems because of epilepsy. And another thing to think about is if you're putting items on display, again, digitally or in person, is there a color contrast? between that object and that background? And is that color contrast something that is uh, a more contrasting in order for folks with low vision to have uh, a better perception of? Another uh, cool thing to think about is al alternatives. So a recommendation is in your space, you could not only present your work and, and light your work, how that work needs to be best lit. But for example, if it's something with lower lighting or if you require a high mounting position of an object in space, then providing a photograph or providing a, uh, a handout with the 
an image of all of your content or artwork in a space is a nice accommodation or alternate format you can provide up front for anybody. You don't even have to ask if someone needs it. You can just have them available at, at, um, at the top. Next slide, we're going to talk about hearing. Um, the image on the screen is a white woman wearing headphones, touching a weaving on a wall. When we think about auditory engagement, so a biggie is, are you offering audio description, right? So maybe you're going to do a tour and audio describe the work in your space, or maybe your content is online and you could make a little audio recording of yourself describing your work and post it online. Um, another thought is, are you playing background music at an event and how loud? Because folks who use assistive devices can have a really hard time focusing if there is loud music in the background and then also conversation going on. And folks who are sensitive to audio input may not be able to participate if background music is too loud. Uh, the next slide, we talk about smell. Uh, but real quick, we had a mention in the chat, uh, a vote for a new symbol and pink to represent disability. I'm for it. <laughs> uh, so when we talk about smell, the image on the screen is an African-American woman holding her nose with her hand out in disgust. So you might uh, you might think, oh, I don't know how smell pertains to you know my work or my event, but it actually can really matter to folks. So if your content create include strong smells, like if you have scented candles in the room or there's motor oil in your work or perfume, it is, it's helpful to give folks a heads up. Some folks can get migraines from strong smells or folks with sensory sensitivities. Just, it would help them to prepare if you, if you made a sign or made a note up front about that sm strong smell. Another thought when we think about engaging um, folks and, and how they interact with our content based on smell is if you can offer a space at an event that can be a quiet space for folks if they do become overwhelmed, be it by, by any part of, of the event, including the crowd. Um, the next slide is touch. And the image on the screen is an older African-American woman named Naomi Davis, who identifies as blind. She's wearing clear plastic gloves on her hands and she's touching a public a Pablo Picasso sculpture at a tactile tour in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So they have actually done tactile tours since 1971 um, at this museum. It's pretty cool. And, and touch can be something that everyone thinks about in preparing to have people with disabilities engage with their work and their space, not asking that you compromise the integrity of your work by allowing people to touch it. It's the thought instead of how can I incorporate touch in what I'm presenting? So could I offer uh, a special showing of my, my sculpture? Can my work be touched? If so, how can I offer that to the community? Um, if my work can't be touched, could I represent it with, you know, a sample of the material that I am using in my artwork? So if it's uh, cloth artwork, then pr bring that cloth. If it's basket weaving, then bring a sample of the, the material that you use so that folks can, can feel that. Another option that has been used before is bringing touchable objects that represent the work or the inspiration behind the work. And so folks can touch those things to get to an, a better idea of, and better understand what they are being presented with. Uh, and finally, the next slide, taste. So the image on screen is of three young women, one with bright pink hair and two with brown and one using a wheelchair. They're all sitting and enjoying beverages together. And when we think about taste, you know, are you offering refreshments at an event? Big thing, bar height is above the heads of most people in wheelchairs. So if you're offering refreshments at an event, you're going to have a bar. Think about alternative tables that you, you might be able to put out or think about um, how someone with a disability who is of shorter height is going to be able to access that same refreshment as everybody else. Uh, another thing Carrie highlighted that food allergies can be a big deal. It can be real serious. So posting a list of ingredients if you're putting out food at an event or just a little warning, this, this uh, food has a common allergen in it is a, a great idea and best practice um, to be inclusive. 
you can do this. Uh, thinking in terms of universal design is a really good way to be inclusive and welcoming for people with disabilities. We are often the canary in the coal mine, right? So planning ahead for us is makes your work and your content more welcoming for everyone. I'm with that, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Hannah Kerr, who's going to give us some more, um, talk us to it with us some more about accessibility. Uh, first, we have a comment in the chat. We, the disabled, have a responsibility to contact the venue or promoter with questions or concerns. We also need to be realistic of our needs. We can't be silent, ashamed of our challenges and want changed. Uh, that's true. Uh, Hannah will talk a little bit more about that. And uh, John put in the chat that a 3D printing of a of a piece of artwork can also be a cool way for someone to tactile use touch to engage your, with your work. Thank you for those comments. Now to you, Hannah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Hannah Kerr. I'm the communications coordinator with the TDC, and I am currently in the middle of nowhere. So if I start to get super glitchy or you can't hear me, please say in the chat or let me know and I can go run to another end of the room. Um, but yeah, so um, Carrie and Sarah touched on a lot of things um, about accessibility that cover you kind of accessibility as a whole, but we're gonna, just gonna do a little bit of a deeper dive and we're gonna talk about what accessibility is in the digital world, as well as what it is in the physical world. So when you think of the word accessibility, what are some things that come to mind? Again, there's no wrong answers. It's just if when you hear that word, is there anything that your mind kind of goes, oh, and you think of? Inclusion, connection, accommodation, no barriers. Yeah, those are awesome. Let's see, ease. Alternate options, best for all, access for all. Those are great. It's hard to read those while they're coming in. They move a lot. Awareness, awesome, yeah. Value, absolutely. All right, so those are a lot of the themes that we're gonna be talking about. And so that's awesome that you guys, head of the game, you've already got them. Um, so let's see. So what can a digital accessibility look like? We're gonna talk about three different things. We're gonna talk about what it can look like on social media, on your websites, and any digital resources that you might have. So those could be like, online versions of resources or handouts or PDFs, flyers, anything that you would put out, maybe email instead of um, have on your website or in social media. Okay, so two big things that you can do to make your content more accessible. It, they're gonna sound small, but they make a world of a difference, I promise. So the first one is um, to add alt text to your images. Oh. You may have to go back. I may have space barred it, Carrie. I got fancy on Mentimeter, y'all. Um, yeah, so adding alt text to your images and adding captions to your videos. So alt text is also known as alternative text uh, or image descriptions. And they're a way for um, someone who may have vision problems, may be blind, may use a screen reader for whatever reason. Um, it helps them access your content. So like on Instagram, where everything is an image, you could have a caption that has nothing to do with your image that is like fun and witty. But then the person who's reading it is like, I don't know what this means, because the screen reader has nothing to read for what the image is. So it really isolates a lot of people from seeing your content. Um, and for adding captions to your videos, I mean, even when I'm on like TikTok or Instagram, if something doesn't have captions, I don't want to watch it. Because what if I am in a space where I can't use audio or I don't understand them? As Sarah was saying, that's like a example of a universal design that is good for everyone. Um, but it's especially important for those who need those captions to access your content. So the next slide, I think I space barred again, Carrie, I'm sorry. 
Awesome. So this is some, we're going to go into some tips and how to write alt text. So um, alt text also, image description, alternate text, they're all the same. Um, the first thing that you want to do is you want to keep it relatively short. So, you know, if there's, you've kind of heard Carrie and Sarah give some descriptions about the slides today. And, you know, they didn't go into depth about how there's weird geometric shapes in half purple in the background on the left. You don't need to go that crazy. Um, just kind of look at the image, have the main themes, the key points, things that you're like, oh yeah, when I see that image, that's kind of what you think of. Um, and also a lot of social media uh, platforms have a character limit on your alt text. So unless you're putting it in the caption portion, um, you're limited anyway. So you wanna keep it relatively short, you want to be descriptive, you want to be accurate. So if there's people in an image and one of them is black and one of them is white, you could just be like two people. Or you could say, you know, a white woman and a black woman sitting together on a bench in a park, if that's what the image was. Um, if your image includes text, include that in your alt text or in your caption. So for instance, um, this event, Reframing Disability Workshop, we had um, a little flyer for that. And um, if you put it on social media and, and you don't put the details in your caption, someone could be like, great, I would maybe want to join this, but what is it? Whereas someone who's not using a screen reader or is fully sighted could just read the poster. But having that alternate format is a great way for people to be able to stay and see what your event is and um, any information that you're trying to share. And lastly, you don't need to include image of or a picture of in your alt text, a screen reader will know that it's an image or a picture and will identify it as such. However, if it's an illustration or a sketch of something, please include that. You just don't need to say, you know, an image of an illustration done by so and so and so and so of a tree. So those are just kind of like my main tenets for writing alt text. And then Really, this is what I do when I write all text. I do social media for the coalition. Um, I work on our website and all of that. So the big thing is after you write your description, read it out loud while you look at whatever it is you're describing. Um, and if it makes sense and you're like, yeah, those two go together, that makes sense. It adds something useful if you couldn't see that image, then typically that's a good measure for the fact that it's probably pretty good alt text. And now you get to hear from Carrie again, um, a little bit about why alt text is important from a first per person perspective. Hi, uh, sorry, I was I was looking for my uh, little microphone and everything. Yeah, so I think I've alluded to the fact that I have a vision disability, right? And Hannah does a, a amazing job of explaining the alt text and and the best practices for that, right? But coming from somebody who um, has, is fully sighted still, right? I, I, I don't have the, the disability, um, the, I'm not categorized as being blind. I want those descriptions, right? I want to know, like in that ableism picture that I showed you guys, right? I want to know that there are bright pink and purple. Sorry, you're driving separate. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I want to know that there are pink and purple colors. Um, and if there is a an image in there, um, I would like to know that. And and Hannah's letting me talk about this today because the best practices, right, are coming from a space where um explaining um, images for people who are blind and, and have probably been blind their whole life or not had a very good visual field, right? But also, especially with your art, because, you know, your art is telling a story. So telling that story, but you could also, as we've talked about, have a really deep um, visual audio description of what that art is so that somebody like me who, who um, wants that deep description of that can, can really visualize what that is um, and be able to experience it in a better, um, have a better experience of what that piece of art is 
just because, you know, my color contrast and depth perception is, is not, um, it's not really in very good existence anymore. So it's hard for me to see those pretty colors, but that's all. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, and thank you for sharing. Um, so that's just a little bit more of something that you could keep on, keep in your mind um, when you're writing that alt text and thinking about it. Um, and alt text, like I've said, is you want it on all of your social media, anything that you post with a picture. Um, but it's also important for your websites. So if you have images, um, there should be whatever your developer uses. I mean, unless you're like hardcore coding and then you're above me. Um, but usually whatever website platform you're using has a spot for alt text. If not, just message whoever is in charge um, and get that. It's also great to put that on if you have like random buttons on your website that's like click here for more. Um, your screen reader doesn't know what click here for more is. So it's the same um, as like adding an alt text for that. So those are just some things on your website to keep in mind. Um, and again, all of this gets like um, creates a better reach for you. So not only are you making it better for people with accessibilities, um, people with disabilities, you're making it more accessible. These are some tongue twister words, let me tell you. Um, but it also allows you to reach more people and we'll have more people see your art and come and do all of the wonderful things that you guys are doing. So now, uh, um, this is my first time presenting with Mentimeter, so we're on a journey together. Okay, so now you guys are gonna try to pick the best alt text description of this image. So you should see an image um, of a track meet with three different options. You can either choose um, track and field, track and field event, or track and field event at the 2008 Beijing Olympics. You guys are right, that was really fast. But yes, the um, track and uh, field event at the Be 2008 Beijing Olympics is the best alt text because it tells you that it is a track and field event and where it is because it's a notable location. Um, you'll notice that they didn't say there were three track runners. One was on, you know, the hurdles or those little minuscule details because again, we're keeping it short to the point, but also accurate um, and describing the main plots of the image. Okay, the next one is you guys are gonna write for this beautiful, beautiful bear and alt text that um, if you were, you know, putting it on your social media, what an alt text you might put would be. Close up of a grizzly bear's face, close up of a large brown bear, big brown grizzly bear face, brown bear up close with a blurry background, brown bear looking up at the camera with rocks in the background. Awesome. Um, feel free to still send them in if you're working on it, but um, those are some great. I didn't even notice the rocks in the background. So look at you. It's still short. It's still descriptive. You could use it. I wrote a close up um, of a large brown bear's face because I'm not a bear expert. So I wasn't 100% sure that it was a grizzly. And I didn't want to put that on him if he's not a grizzly. You know, he could be Smokey the Bandit for all I know. Smokey the Bear, Smokey the Bandit's a movie. References. They're hard, man. Um, but yeah, so just a little short blurb that tells someone who's. Um, using that screen reader or wants to get a better, you know, understanding, like Carrie said, who may not be completely blind, but it's like, oh, I wonder what that image is all about. It's a little blurry for me. So you guys did great. So now we're going to talk. I may have space barred again, Carrie. I really don't even know how I did that, but I got real fancy for y'all. Um, yeah, so captions are kind of like your alt text for your images. You can also do a video description a blurb that just says, you know, this video is, and it's an alt text for your video. But the main thing is to add those captions. And so there's closed captions and then there's open captions. Closed captions are where you can turn them on and off. So like on your TV, on YouTube, 
those kind of things. Open captions are like when you watch um, a TikTok or an Instagram or some other kind of social media where they're burned in, they're on the screen and you can't turn them on or off. Um, preference, it's really up to you. Um, closed captions are great. We use open captions on our Instagram and Facebook and those kind of things for videos. Um, if we're not using YouTube, that way you have them because Instagram is not the most accessible. They've taken some steps. They just added a spot actually where you can add alt text in it. You don't have to put it in the captions, which yay is so awesome because now our captions don't have to be twice as long. Um, so that's really exciting. But for apps like that and TikTok, you want to make sure that you have those captions on your video in case they're not, you know, doing it for you because they're still kind of lacking in the accessibility world. Um, you want to captioning by hand. Let me tell you, as someone who's done many a webinar uh, captioning, it can be tedious and long um, and frustrating at times, but it's important to caption by hand when you can um, because it gets more accurate. Technology is great and I use it all the time to help me with these things and I'll go over some apps that I like to use. Um, but sometimes, you know, technology is only so good. They don't know, they don't pick up on someone's accent or they thought that someone said this instead of that and then the whole sentence doesn't make sense. And if that's your only way of consuming that content, it can be really confusing. Um, and the last thing is always, always, always review your video with your captions and timings before you publish it. Because the last thing you want to do is do all of this work for your captions and then you play the video and they don't match up and you, you wasted your time or you're just really, really frustrated. And that's not fun for anybody. So next slide. Yeah, so these are some apps to help you caption. Um, YouTube is great at um, syncing a transcript to uh, the person that's talking. It's also pretty good for auto-generating um, those captions. So if you wanna let YouTube try to do it and then you kind of comb through it afterwards, that's great. Instagram, Facebook, um, TikTok, they all have features now where you can um, hit the little icon when you're editing up at the top and add captions. Um, you can't caption them by hand if you do it that way, but that caption is better than nothing. So if you don't have the time to comb through it and put it in you know, an editing software, that's better than nothing. And they're usually pretty accurate. They just sometimes are lacking. Um, and then these last two or two that I use on almost all of our video content, um, the purple one at uh, the far right is a uh, big VU teleprompters and captions. Um, if you pop a video in there, it will come up with a transcript for you. Again, comb through that, but if you're doing like it all on your phone and you don't wanna put it on a laptop or put it in YouTube, this is a great app that I've found um, that's completely free for you to pop that video in, let it transcribe it for you, and you just kind of go in for afterwards. It also does the timings for you, which is super, super helpful. So all you have to do again is go in and read it and make sure it all makes sense. Um, and it makes captions as long as you're okay with their little logo in the tiny corner. Um, it's free as well, and it is a great way for you to add captions to your videos if you're not doing it in an app. Instagram used to only let you caption a 30-second video but now they're letting you caption, I think, a minute. So like I said, we're getting there with the accessibility, but sometimes, you know, like at the TDC, our videos are two to three minutes on policy, so that's not a good fit for us, which is why I use these other apps. But as long as you're adding captions, I mean, that's a step towards accessibility in and of itself. So these are just some tips, some tools that I use, um, and hopefully they help you too when you're adding captions. All right, and the big question, is your digital content accessible? Do you wanna know? Ask people with disabilities to test it out. So um, one, it's great to have people with disabilities in your circle, in your community. One, because diversity is great. We are a part of diversity. It's great to have another perspective. As you can tell, we make art, we have uh, value, we add so many beautiful things um, to the world. So, I mean, obviously, get you some friends with disabilities if you don't have them already. But also there are people and places that you can um, hire to look at your website and your content and those kind of things um, to you know, really be like, 
I want my website to be accessible, but I don't know what that means. And I don't know how to do that. Someone please help. Um, and so there are definitely places to do that. And on the next slide, I have some resources and we call this user testing. Um, and so Upwork and Fiverr are great at, um, you can create like kind of like a LinkedIn post and be like, hey, I'm looking for someone with a screen reader to test, you know, my website or look at this content, put up kind of a job posting. Um, and that's great. It's also sometimes cheaper if you have um, just one or, you know, a couple people that are testing little projects here and there. But if you're wanting to do like a complete overhaul at your website or something that's a little more complex, um, these digital accessibility companies are great. Um, Amnet Systems and Interactive Accessibility. Um, I'm not sure that we've used these, but we had recommendations from some of our partner organizations that these are the people to call. So here's just some resources for you guys. If you need them, um, we wanna equip you to be able to make these accessibility changes. So that's part of that. All right, moving to physical accessibility. When you think of accessibility in the physical world, what are some things that comes to mind? Ramps, absolutely. Accessible to all spaces, curbs, elevators, signage that I can see. Yes, absolutely. Restroom accommodations. Short level distances, blocked sidewalks, lighting. Someone in the chat said seating for rests. Absolutely. These are great. And I'm going to touch on most of these. So, again, head of the curb, guys. Good job. So, let's see. I really, I guess, like the space bar method because it has happened. But here we go. Yes, yeah, some barriers to think about. So, when you're planning, uh, an event, an art show, a class, or maybe, you know, you're moving buildings or whatever the thing that you're doing is. If you're planning something where people are physically going to come, these are some things to keep in the back of your mind um, for accessibility purposes. So are your entrances accessible? What are the doors like? Are they those big, heavy doors that, you know, you have to take all of your strength to open? Do they have a um, push button that automatically opens them? Is there a lip to get in the door? Because that may not seem like a lot for, you know, someone who's able-bodied, but if you have a mobility aid or a wheelchair, those little lips are like half steps. They're not a full stair, but they're still a barrier. So those are things to think about. Um, if there are stairs, are there ramps? If it's multi-leveled, um, are there elevators? How are people gonna access, you know, all of the space? We mentioned this earlier that um, the place of your plaques or your art, um, and as someone in the chat said, your other um, signs that you can see. Yes, um, so signs you can see at different levels. Um, as Sarah said, these are all ways to be inclusive, even if they are barriers that still exist. So we're not on HGTV house hunting, getting your dream with everything that you could ever want, unless you're building something from the ground that's usually not gonna happen. So these are all things to be, just keep in mind for accessible purposes. Um, because yeah, unless you're building it from scratch, most buildings and spaces, especially if they're older, are not gonna meet all of these. Um, places to sit down and rest, absolutely. Buttons and doors, knob access, absolutely. Um, tables also, Sarah talked about the height of tables. But also, if you have someone that's coming to your event that uh, uses a wheelchair or has a dog guide or other uh, mobility aids, make sure there's an open seat at the table for them to come or make sure there's enough room in the space for them to have a seat with um, all of the necessary things that they have. So again, just things to be thinking about while you're um, planning whatever it is you may be planning in your spaces. All right, next slide. And the key to making an inclusive space is to ask the individuals in your community what they need. All right, 
next slide. So this goes right along with that. If you can, it's great. If you don't know who's gonna be you know, in a class or an event, have a place where people, whether it's an RSVP form or an email address for someone to reach out on on your um, advertisements that says, hey, wanna know um, about accessibility, reach here. If you need any accommodations to participate, what are those accommodations so that we can try to meet them? Um, it's great to have a place where people can tell you what they need because again, no place is gonna have all of these unless you're in a dream world or in my Sims game that you created it. And so asking the people what they need to participate is the best way um, to have the needs of your community met. And so accommodations. Um, accommodations can sound like a scary word if you don't know what they are or you're new to this game, but really they're just modifications or things um, that are extra that someone might need to participate due to their disability. So a few things could be ASL interpreters, um, which is American Sign Language, uh, alternative uh, formats of materials. So maybe someone needs um, your resource or the class material in Braille or in large print, or they need a transcript of the video. Those kind of things um, would be alternate formats. We've already talked about it a few times today. Um, audio descriptions or audio guides for if you have an art show or a museum um, or that kind of thing. Uh, recordings of virtual events. So if, um, you know, uh, like for this, we're recording this, you could go back and watch it. And sometimes if it's just a meeting, some people may request a recording so that they can go back and watch it um, to retain information better that way. And then a remote option. I know it's not always possible, but one good thing that came out of COVID is that we did become more um, inclusive in that digital world and Zooming and those kind of things. So when it is possible and someone requests it, try to have that option as well. All right, now I told you what these big accommodations are. How do you get them? How do you find them? So that's what we're gonna talk about next. Um, you don't have to have all of these things like ASL interpreters and braille, and large um, text and plain language, all of these things like for every event. Um, you just need to know what they are and have a plan to contact someone to get those things if they're requested. So don't think that just like the physical space isn't gonna meet all of those things that we talked about, you don't have to have all of these ready for every event. Just, you know, be prepared. And then sometimes despite all of your best efforts, like we mentioned, there still might be barriers to accessibility. And if there are is just be upfront and transparent about it. It's better to just lay it all out there and say, you know, we tried, this is the best, this is our space, X, Y, and Z, um, then rather someone show up and not be able to participate. And now even more fun, resources to help improve your accessibility. Um, this next one you may have seen, it is a um, one pager, infographic type thing that we, the Tennessee Disability Partner uh, Coalition partnered with ArtsBuild. Um, it's on ArtsBuild's social media. It's on our website. Um, this is great. It has a lot of what we've talked about today. So I would recommend if you're planning an event to have this printed out or on your computer where you can go back and reference it um, because it is a lot of things to keep in mind and kind of checklist when you're not used to thinking about all of these things. Um, and this is a great resource to help you with that. Um, and then we wanted to give you guys some Chattanooga area based um, resources. So you're not like, you know, have ASL and you don't know where to find that. So um, a few ones in the Chattanooga area are the Chattanooga Interpreting LLC and the Partnership for Families, Children and Adults. And the average cost is about $55 an hour. So we wanted to give you that too, because accommodations, it doesn't cost that much to have um, people be able to, um, access and include in your event. Um, another resource we have is Braille document translation. The signal centers is great. It usually costs about $20 per page, 50 an hour. Um, plain language document translation, the ARC of Tennessee, um, that's a free service. So people just, you know, if they need, if they request plain language document of a, fo of a form or something that you have, you could reach out to them. 
live captioning or CART, communication access real-time translation, uh, Tennessee captioning, it's $125 an hour. Uh, Tennessee Relay Service is a free statewide assisted telephone service to those with um, speech, hearing, and visual impairments. Uh, relay service uh, links connections between people who use text telephones and telebraille devices and people who use standard telephones. This is a free service. You can call them if you were to need that service. And then remote foreign language translation and interpretation. Uh, SpokenHere.com is great for that. It's uh, two minutes, two dollars per minute for interpretation and sixty dollars per page for document translation. And then we've got some upcoming resources for you to keep your eye out. We have a new disability etiquette guide, um, which is a lot about just how to interact and include people with disabilities in your world. And we are partnering with our developer to create a website accessibility series. So some tips and tricks and where to go to up your website accessibility. So those are coming soon, so be on the lookout. And so now that you've heard all of us talk, um, what are some things that you think that you could do to make your art spaces more inclusive going forward? Seating, ask for what folks need, absolutely. Alt text and captions. Awesome, those are some great things. Uh, budget for services, absolutely. Audio descriptions, website overhaul, um, easier, closer to parking, accessibility info page. Yeah, that's great for your website too. So you can tell people, hey, this is what we are. This is what we're striving for. Those kind of things. Um, budget for services, awesome. Yeah, those are all great things. And now, are there any questions about anything at all that you had that weren't answered. Um, and if I can't answer it, someone else will join right in, I'm sure. See, there's Sarah right there. We will also make sure that our Arts Build hosts have a copy of this presentation. So for example, the contact information for each of the resources that Hannah shared, you'll have access to, and, and we're around. So if you have a question after today, please reach out. Quick question. So um, as we know, um, making our spaces inclusive does cost money and sometimes budgets, um, might not have that much money currently in their budget for it. Are there funding sources to support that movement forward and being more inclusive? So good question. Um, actually, it doesn't always cost money to be more inclusive. Like creating that RSVP form in advance of an event is free. Um, there are, you know, Google Forms are free. There are free platforms to do that. So that's one way to be more inclusive that's free. Um, also, several of the resources that we provided to provide accommodations and alt formats, alternative formats are free. So um, that, that holds true both for serving people with disabilities, engaging people with disabilities, and hiring people with disabilities. 50% of accommodations provided to employees with disabilities, according to the Federal Job Accommodations Network, are free. And the other 50% that costs money on average is about $300 per employee. So accommodation sounds so big and expensive, but it's not always, it's, it's not most of the time. So I just have to say that. Thank you for giving me an opening. And, um, and thank you for, for asking the question about funding. So yes, there are funding sources to um, make 
to provide accommodations. There are funding sources to provide physical modifications to your physical space in order to be more ADA compliant. Um, I can send our, our hosts an email with the um, recommendations from the Americans with Disabilities um, Act Southeast ADA Center, um, which offers a list of some resources for making changes to your physical space in order to become ADA accessible. Um, so there, there are funding options for that. And then small things um, like providing accommodations, there are small, there are government grant programs um, in the state of Tennessee to apply for, to uh, budget, to provide accommodations for people. Um, there's also um, nonprofit. So for example, the Bill and Linda um, Frist Foundation. I may have pronounced her name wrong. The Frist Foundation, first names Sarah can't remember, has a technology grant that um, the coalition has used and several of our partners have used to provide funding for making website changes um, to be more accessible, for example. So I'll put together a little list and send it to um, our Arts Build hosts. Does that answer your question? Thank you for being brave enough to ask it. And I have a question as far as that goes. One of some of our members, and I'm, I'm with the AIM Center, um, we have some members who have hearing aids and such, and they want to be able to work the receptionist desk, but they can't because of their hearing aid and the phone system. So would that type of grant help with that? So you're talking about employment? No. No, okay. they're just clubhouse members and they just help with inside of the everything that we do, we do side by side. So you're talking about serving a program, serving someone with a disability and that, correct? Yes. Okay. And that community member is asking for the access to a phone system. Yes. So usually when we think about how to provide you know, equity, we think about what that ultimate goal is. So what is, what is the phone service? What's that service that the phone is providing for them? Um, being inclusive to be able to help just like everyone else. Um, she's limited um, because of her hearing aid. It, it rings if something, if there's like an audio device too close to her, she gets a high pitch ringing in her ear. And she Got wants it. to help, but she's limited. Got it. So generally, when we think about um, how to provide the same experience or the same content, you know, you think about the goal. And if the goal is that you have this community member who wants to answer questions from the community, is that right? Mm -hmm. The first step might be, what are other ways that she can answer questions from the community? You know, um, do you get questions via survey? Do you get questions from people walking in, for example? Um, so that uh, thinking about alternatives. And then then you the if really what you want to do is you want to give her access to provide um, communication support and your current phone system, uh, you could contact your current phone provider and ask them what available alternatives they have. So for example, we use Verizon and Verizon has an app um, that some of our staff use in, um, in order to, to, you know, use text to communicate um, it, that, that TTY um, option that Hannah shared as an alternative. Um, so I'm talking about free ways to accomplish the same goal before thinking about having to pay for something new to give her access to, to do something specific. And your specific question, if I remember, was, is there a technology grant to do X, Y, Z? You'd have to look at the specific um, requirements for that grant. And I'll, I'll include the, you know, the contact information for the technology grant. Um, but if you want to think through a uh, a barrier experiencing or an access need that you have, you can always contact the Tennessee Disability Coalition and we will help to the best of our ability. All right, thank you. 
you, ladies. Um, sorry, I wasn't able to introduce myself earlier. This is Amy with Artsfield. So um, looks like we're a little bit over time. So just want to respect everybody's time here. And um, if there are additional questions, appreciate you all being so accessible to us. Um, and providing all the information. Thanks for being here. I know I learned a lot um, listening in, and uh, I'm definitely going to dive into some alt tech stuff because that's super interesting and I know super useful. So thank you for that. Um, just wanted to give, uh, before we go, understand if everybody's got to jump off, but just a few quick announcements uh, for Artsfield. So next Friday uh, from 9.30 to 10.30, we will have our, uh, or excuse me, 10.30 to 11.30. Uh, we'll have our uh, monthly Friday community Zoom where our own Brianna Jones uh, we'll talk about uh, our uh, a special project that we've got going on here at Artsfield, and then Melissa and I have a few things to share with you then too. Um, but for the folks on here, uh, we invite you to apply for the Holmberg Arts Leadership Institute, which um, we are openly recruiting right now. Um, that information is found on Artsfield's uh website and we're also recruiting for our tech goes home for the high school artist so if you know a student who is uh, going to be enrolling in the ninth through 12th grade or recently graduated from Hamilton County Schools or is about to graduate. Um, they are invited uh, to sign up for this program so it's a way for us to work with our young creatives. Uh, in how they uh, promote themselves online safely and uh, eventually will be able to monetize their work. Um, at the end of this free program that uh, is brought to us by some really great organizations that are listed on our website, um, they will get a free laptop. So um, some great access accessibility there. So if you know a young artist uh, who will be in high school next year or recently graduated, send them our way. Um, and uh, Melissa, did you have anything that you wanted to plug in? No, just join us on community Zoom next Friday. Yeah, from 1030 to 1130. Um, and make sure you're signed up for ArtsWire. Uh, that's Artsfield's weekly um, email newsletter. Uh, you can do that through our website. Super easy. It's on the home page. Um, and that's where you'll find all the information about us and other organizations who we work with if they're recruiting or have special events going on. So thanks a lot, everybody, for being here. Go enjoy uh, this weekend. Hopefully it won't rain too much tomorrow. But um, thanks again for everybody being here. And thank you, ladies, for a great presentation. Thank you.